Well, it is an interesting time in our world. I imagine that uh, many of us were casting our vision south of the border this week to see what would happen in the United States general election. And I confess to you that I did not expect that the American people would re-elect Donald Trump. I didn't imagine that they wouldn't remember what happened the last time he was in office. I couldn't imagine that they wouldn't remember all the things he has said and the things he has done. But that's the thing about remembering. Our memories are very fleeting, aren't they? I know I need to write things down or I won't remember them, either in my phone or on a, in a notebook. I also know that if you are told something enough times, you can start to believe that it's true, whether or not it is the thing you first remembered. And for many people, short-term memory in particular can be very fleeting, especially as we get older. How many of us haven't forgotten where we put our wallet or our keys or our glasses or the list goes on and on? And these days, there are a lot of people investing a lot of money into shifting our memories or distracting us from the things we might otherwise remember. Advertising and political campaigns are designed to shift and spin the story we remember. I think that's part of what we saw in the United States this week. Significant and divided portions of the population are remembering the stories very, very differently from each other. I wonder if you're familiar with what's called the Mandela effect. It's when a large segment of the people misremember something or share a memory of something that didn't actually happen. happen. Um, re researcher Fiona Broom coined the term uh, to describe this collective false memory when she discovered that a significant number of people at a conference she was attending in 2010 shared her memory that Nelson Mandela had died in prison during the 1980s. They all remembered that. And in fact, <laughs> the former president of South Africa was released from prison in 1990 and was actually very much alive at the time of the conference. And so she started calling it the Mandela effect. And there are very many famous examples. Uh, they include this quote from Snow White. Most of us have in our brains the quote is, mirror, mirror on the wall. It's not. It's actually magic mirror on the wall. And then there's the famous Star Wars quote that most of us remember as, Luke, I am your father. That's not the line at all. Well, it's close. It's, no, I am your father. And how is it possible that Ricky never said, Lucy, you have some splaining to do? He never said it. Or that Captain Kurt actually never said, beam me up, Scotty. We are certain that he did. Nope. And did you know that in the entire movie of Casablanca, no one actually says, Play it again, Sam. The Mandela effect. So what do we do then in this day and age when we clearly cannot count on our memories? The ancient peoples talked a lot about memory. So many of the stories ask the people to recite their story, to reenact and remember a story about how God had traveled with them. Because one of the hallmarks of the faith journey we read about in the pages of the Bible is collective remembrance. When the people forget, things don't go well for them. And then, together, they remember. They tell each other the story so that even if they can't personally remember what happened, they trust that the community will remember for them kind of like you did in the theme time with me and Cadence. Today's story 
is about just that. Throughout the book of Nehemiah, you hear a story about people returning from exile, rebuilding the temple, and restoring the walls of the city. Things, after a long time, things were finally okay. And the story may well have ended right there. They all kind of lived happily ever after, the end. Well, okay, it doesn't, but it could have been the end for that story. But instead, it goes on, and Ezra reads from the books of the laws of Moses for everyone to hear. For some, women and children particularly, this may have been the very first time ever that they heard the actual words. Because most of the time it was read in the temple, women and children couldn't go in there. And for the, <clears throat> excuse me, and for the many who could not read, the opportunity to hear the actual laws of Moses were rarer than you might think. And so this was a kind of big moment that for the first time people were hearing the words of those stories that they had been trying to remember for years. And, but instead of making the people happy, it appears that the crowd is dismayed. And the commentators don't actually agree on why this might be. It could be the particular spin that those who were interpreting the laws, because we hear it was read and also the Levites were circulating telling them what it meant. So it could be that the spin that those Levites were using was making the people feel bad about themselves because even then people could be found who would interpret the scripture to suit their own purposes. Thank you very much. Or perhaps the people were moved to tears by the realization that what they thought they remembered about Moses' teachings didn't match what they had actually been teaching and learning and living. Having just been returned home from exile, the people may have realized just how far they had wandered from God's way without even being aware of it. This is the most common interpretation, it's the most common assumption, and I think it's one that is helpful for us to consider. Because when we don't help each other remember, we start to Mandela effect and remember alternate truths. And then we can stray off the paths that we thought we were traveling. Tomorrow in our country is an opportunity to remember. We set aside the 11th month, the 11th day, the 11th hour as a collective remembrance to pause and be silent and to contemplate the cost of war. And it is interesting to me that we bring even now different kinds of memories to that event. For some people, it will be a stark reality about what soldiers and their loved ones go through when we use war as a problem solving technique. I know that on Remembrance Day in Altona, the people of Un the Altona United Church, what they, when they remember this day, what they think about is being a refuge for families who had made the choice to support their country in war against the Mennonite culture of peace and nonviolence that surrounded them. And yet I rather suspect that Mennonites and Quakers and other, uh, other pacifists in our country might be remembering the conscientious objectors who were called cowards for courageously following what they believed the Bible was teaching them about being committed to nonviolence. And it wasn't until really more recent years, a full 50 years in fact, after World War II, that we finally started to remember and hear about the 12,000 or so First Nation Inuit and Métis people who had no status, but instead were willing to risk their lives, signed up, joined up, and fought for their or what, king of king and country against abuses of power? We don't know what motivated them to participate, but we do know it took us a very long time to remember them. There is no single motivation for those who offer their lives to military service. But the cost to those who do can be very high. I think the numbers are 
1,000 Canadians who died in the First World War, more than 45,000 in World War II, and countless others wounded in body and spirit. And we continue, to, we refer to those wars sometimes as if wars don't continue, as if there are not many armed conflicts continuing even now, many of which Canada is involved with in Ukraine, in Iraq, and in Jordan, and in Lebanon, and in Egypt. What I appreciate most about Remembrance Day is that we are given the gift of this opportunity to remember. And that the community can help enlarge our individual memories so that we can remember all of the various atrocities of war and all of the people who are impacted by political decisions that then can cost people their lives. These should not be easy decisions. And I'm encouraged when, as a culture, we commit to festivals of remembrance. Because, as the saying goes, those who forget their history are doomed to repeat it. We need to help each other remember. Because our memories are short and easily altered. Now, in Nehemiah, when the people are grieving how much they've forgotten, Ezra and the other leader, leaders can encourage them not to sit in pity, dwelling on all the stuff they didn't remember, but instead to use every opportunity to enact their remembering instead. So to take the words that they were hearing and to follow them to enjoy good foods and make sure to share with those who had none. Celebrate festivals that help you remember your story together so that we don't veer off so far next time. And so they did. And in these days, when we're so aware of how much we forget, I wonder how we can help ourselves remember. When it seems like people around us might be forgetting what truly matters and forgetting that we need each other. Isn't that a problem of our culture today? We kind of forget how much we need each other. I wonder if we can leap into opportunities we have to remember and show what does matter and show that it does matter. I wonder how we can help each other remember into our future. God help us. Our future may just depend on it. Amen. <laughs>